Health and Human Services Secretary Alex Azar will visit the President of Taiwan in the coming days. They plan to discuss the global response to the CCP virus pandemic, as well as supplies of medical equipment and technology. Secretary of Health and Human Services Alex Azar is set to visit Taiwan. It's the highest level visit by U.S. official in four decades. Taiwan's foreign ministry said Azar will meet with President Tsai Ing-wen. He'll also be accompanied by chief medical officer at the CDC, Mitchell Wolf, as well as other members of the administration. Azar said in a statement, I look forward to conveying President Trump's support for Taiwan's global health leadership. He wrote that the U.S. and Taiwan have a shared belief that free and democratic societies are the best model for protecting and promoting health. The U.S. is helping Taiwan gain international support. The Chinese regime does not recognize Taiwan's independence and considers the island one of its own provinces. Taiwan's health minister referred to the visit as a major step forward. The CCP has been using more sophisticated technology and putting more money in surveillance. This brings the CCP surveillance state to the next level. The CCP surveillance has expanded into monitoring users' offline conversations. The Chinese version of popular video sharing app TikTok, called Douyin, has again been accused by some users of doing the same. But it's not the only one. One user, Ms. Yang, told Radio Free Asia about something strange she noticed while using TikTok and Chinese shopping app Taobao. She noticed the Taobao app, the largest online shopping platform in China, has pushed notifications for items she's mentioned while talking in person with co-workers. That's despite her not making related searches for similar items online or mentioning them during phone conversations. Professionals say it's a common practice among apps made in China. According to Mr. Jin, a former data engineer for Huawei, Chinese apps are certainly able to record information without users even running the apps. Taobao and WeChat are suspected of storing personal data from Ms. Yang and readily sharing it with the regime. Early in 2017, an internal document from the CCP Stability Maintenance Department stated that video monitoring can be extended to people's homes or through mobile phone software. The policy was put in place to refine Project Dazzling Snow, a nationwide project envisioned to create full geographic coverage, full network sharing, full-time coverage, and full operational control. CCP has invested huge amounts of money in the initiative. NTD's sister media, the Epoch Times, obtained an internal document detailing municipal-level project budgets, specifically for Anhui province. The document revealed that the region's major city of Wuhu has already invested an amount equaling one-fifth of its annual education budget and one-third of its annual medical care expenses. Another common method used by the party in order to secure its control over all individuals is to divide areas into grids and monitor them accordingly. A city in the southern end of Anhui province even takes it one step further. Authorities there set up a CCP branch inside each grid section to ensure the effectiveness of its big brother control. Still, another city inside Anhui is also involved, called Bengbu. It's home to nearly 4 million people. That city alone uses around 12 million U.S. dollars from its budgets every year to find the grid sensor workers. That's to guarantee at least one person is assigned to each surveillance grid section. Reporting by Xu Wenhui, NTD News. More and more natural disasters are hitting parts of China. Some face flooding while others have drought. Elsewhere, an unusual lightning strike shocked locals. NTD's Tiffany Meyer brings us more. A rare scene in a Chinese city has shocked locals. On Monday night, a residential high-rise building in the northeastern city of Xinjiang was hit by a huge lightning bolt. Immediately after, a flash of what looked to be fire and sparks shot down the side of the building and struck the ground, sending sparks flying. Another citizen captured the scene from a different angle and posted it online. A local told us the building was newly built and wasn't damaged. The building was not damaged at all. The strike hit the ground very bright and super loud. At around 7 o'clock on the 3rd, it was raining heavily in Shenyang, extremely heavy rain with thunder. 
Local media reports say no one was injured. They explained that the lightning struck high voltage wires and ignited weeds on the front lawn. They added that the wires were not damaged and are still functioning. A netizen commented on Chinese social media platform Weibo calling this year a year of life-threatening danger, urging everyone to pay attention to safety. Rainstorms continue to fall in the city. The local meteorological agency has issued an amber thunderstorm warning overnight, expecting strong winds and possible hail. Elsewhere, floods, typhoon, virus, drought and locusts are battering different parts of China. Typhoon Haogupit brought heavy rains and strong winds to China's eastern coastal areas in Zhejiang province after it made landfall on Monday night. Winds blew up to 85 miles per hour at its center. It was moving north at 15 miles per hour in the direction of Shanghai. A red warning was issued. Big waves hit the coast, water pouring down from the sky. the wind blowing forcefully. Trees are uprooted where the typhoon passes, lightning strikes, streets are submerged underwater. In a video, streets can be seen covered with water. The motor vehicles are half submerged in the flood. They move in the water like boats and people wade through the water. A political science professor from South Carolina is facing pressure from his college to take training in diversity, bias and inclusion. The professor could be fired if he doesn't comply, but still he is unwavering. He says it violates his freedom of conscience. Converse College in South Carolina recently mandated that all staff members complete diversity, bias and inclusion training. The training used to be voluntary, but this changed after George Floyd's death. But the administration must be either naive or disingenuous uh, to deny that there is an ideological content and substructure to this material. Does the urge to impose upon us this material derive from a sincere desire to free the college and its members from bigotry or from a felt need on the part of our leadership and throughout the academic world, truth to tell, to impose an ideological conformity which masks itself? as an embrace of diversity. Professor Pulvordi says he doesn't take issue with the content. In fact, he's tried to reason with the college. He says if they make the training voluntary again, he will take it. But the problem, he says, is it's mandatory. So he feels that, you know, requiring him um, to be trained in the university's ideology as a requirement of his employment there, as a condition of his employment there, violates his freedom of conscience. The administration dismisses this claim since they have not allocated correct answers, only preferred answers. The training includes material on topics like managing bias and diversity and inclusion, among others. I believe, you know, this is part of a much greater effort to sort of impose, you know, political and ideological orthodoxies on society um, and to really sort of purge the universities and the media and to even to some extent private companies of people who don't agree with the prevailing ideology. And whatever that ideology may be, that simply isn't compatible with freedom. Um, you know, I mean, in, in my mind, what's happening now on university campuses and in the media and again, to some extent in, in the corporate world, too, is akin to McCarthyism. You know, it's it's this is the official ideology. And if you don't ascribe to it, um, you know, we're going to. We're going to cut, cut you out, basically. Um, and so I think it is the attorney says recently she's had a growing number of cases like this where people's jobs are put on the line if they express any opinion that is not consistent with the official ideology. So she says it's important to stand up against this trend. Yeah, I mean, if we have this type of ideological uniformity in our universities and in the media and people are not being exposed to a wide range of viewpoints, um, I don't think that they will, frankly, be capable of defending their freedom. I mean, one of the she says the only way to fight back is to have courage, like Dr. Polvorty, who is standing up to fight it in the face of losing his job. Melina Weiskup, NTD News.